machines can't think as people do. The machine is different. Give yourselves a round of applause because you're the brave people who are here tonight. I can't tell you how many people we have talked to that grown adults that either they've seen this movie before and they will not see it again, or they've never seen it and they refuse to come see it. And so that's why we thought this is really interesting. You're brave. Please stay for the movie. Don't leave afterwards. Um, we do have a PowerPoint slide that we were going to show. One of the things is um, some of my graduate students helped with some of the their assignment first year counseling students was to kind of come up with some of the PowerPoint slides on this and they all looked at me with glazed eyes for the last month or two. They're like, you're supposed to teach me how to be a therapist. And I was like, well, this is therapy 101. So, um, let's see. Uh, one of the things that we also want to talk about is why do we pay to be afraid? And I think Stephen had, um, oh, there we go. There we go. Here we go. Why do we experience fear? So we can go to the next slide. Yeah, why do we pay to be afraid? And I think, um, Stephen, you had some thoughts on this. I had one or two thoughts, yes. Um, thank you. And thank you to the Robinson. This is the best theater in the world. And uh, to NAMI for sponsoring all this. And thank you all for coming. Now, we're all here for a showing of Yentl, correct? Right. <laughs> now, we're here for The Exorcist. Why did you pay to see this? This is, uh, this is a scary film. It was, um, it was first released in 1973, and uh, the world had not seen anything like it at that time. Um, and here, some 40-plus years later, it's still, uh, it's still scary enough that, as Meredith said, we have friends who said, you know, good luck with that. We're not coming. We're not going to sit and watch that. Um, so so y'all are the brave, uh, brave citizens of Shreveport. So why do we pay to be afraid? Um, there are a lot of different theories behind that, and we're going to talk about some of those. We have all of 15 to 20 minutes to, to talk about something that we could spend all night talking about. But uh, we'll quickly cover some of the sort of major theories. One um, that this slide sort of evokes is, um, or one theory, is something very scientifically named the snuggle theory. <laughs> this will be a little heads up. Uh, the snuggle theory is, I'm not making that up, uh, in 1986 some researchers took, am I talking to? Uh, in 1986 some researchers took a bunch of uh, adolescents and uh, put some plants in the audience and, and paired them up and um, they did this study to see how they reacted to um, to watching a scary film and they found it was very interesting and, um, it, and it, it also kind of reveals that, that nature is a little bit sexist um, because it revealed that one function that uh, horror movies serve in our culture is um, sort of a codification of traditional sexual gender roles because what they found was that Men reported liking the film a lot more when their female counterparts um, showed sort of exaggerated fear behaviors. So if they covered their eyes, if they screamed, if they squirmed in their chair, the men reported liking it a lot more. Conversely, women reported liking the film a lot less when their male counterparts did the same thing. <laughs> so, so that's just one, one, one of many theories to explain why we like these films, and it probably explains why these films uh, mostly appeal to um, a younger audience. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Um, so yeah, horror brings in over 413 million annually. Um, and one of the things we talked about, we, we've decided on Exorcist, but we had also looked at maybe showing The Shining um, and Halloween and some other movies. But let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Okay, so, and this is where, so we're talking about The Exorcist. This is probably one of the highest grossing um, so, yeah. horror films. And um, it came out in 73, as Stephen said, and it was just fascinating for people. So there are some YouTube videos mm -hmm. that I know that you looked at that you show audience members from the original screening, and they are like, oh my 
passing out, fainting, vomiting. Um, they're leaving the theater. None of that's going to happen tonight. Um, and it would just it caused a sensation. So I think that's kind of what Stephen is going to talk about some of these right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, but it's funny too because you see some other reactions when you watch these videos, and there are some people who have this look on their face, and they're being interviewed, and they're going, "Wow, that was." <laughs> That was pretty intense. And you know, those are the people that are going to pay to see it again. The people who are passed out, who are crying, <laughs> those people are not repeat viewers. But, but those wide-eyed yahoos, those are the people that watch this film. They probably went back the next day to see it again. And that's kind of that reaction that we're going to talk about. But again, you know, why? Why do some people react with horror? Why do some people, why are some people delighted by it? Um, and there's, like I said, there's a variety of reasons. Um, for one thing, they appeal to our sense of novelty, and, and the PowerPoint here kind of touches on that. Um, intrigued because of the fear of the unknown. Um, and also, um, you know, let's face it, The Exorcist, especially in 1973 and, you know, 1971 when the book came out, touches on some really taboo subject matter and has some really, really graphic taboo scenes that, you know, again, 40 plus years later continue to shock. Um, there is, whether we like to admit it or not, there is that part of the human psyche that likes to stop and look at the car wreck. Um, horror movies are sort of a safe, uh, a safe avenue with which to do that. Um, and I just wanted to quickly say, because we're about to talk about NAMI and, and, and just sort of the stigma of mental illness on screen, um, but one of the things that I think makes this movie so powerful is that the, the writer and the director, William Friedkin, made it hyper-realistic, and so one of the, I mean, for the first hour, and especially to someone who's new to it, who is reading it for the first time, seeing it for the first time, for the first hour or so of the movie, um, the protagonist, the psychiatrist Damien Karras, is just trying to figure out if he's dealing with, and he thinks he's dealing with, mental illness, even though he's also a priest. Um, and so, and they show some pretty, very, you know, real, very realistic, um, medical procedures and, and of course trying to trying to kind of tackle this medically psychologically at first so um, but anyway to talk more about that yeah so let's move into the next slide and when we talk about I mean so media versus real life so we talked about the dollar for Hollywood on these type of movies and one of the things that NAMI sort of partnered with this is is that Mentally ill people are stigmatized in Hollywood, and you see that a lot. And so you see that um, we get the same stereotypes, and we often give the public the wrong impression of what it's like to be mentally ill. So I'm kind of going to talk about three concepts around that. So let's move to the next slide. So type, type one, <laughs> the psychosis, is that um, mental illness is mostly accompanied by psychotic symptoms. No, people deal with mental illness millions of us deal with mental illness and we don't have psychotic features and we're not violent and we're not aggressive and all these types of things. So that's sort of that uh, stereotype and portrayal that we wanted to recognize. Um, let's move to the next slide. This one is actually the most interesting to me is that many times we think that they're caused by traumatic childhood adolescent experiences and different types of causes are out there. So I'm going to do a little um, let's see. All right, so I'm going to read off. So the character, how many people in here have seen the movie? Okay, good. And those of you who haven't seen the movie, but you're going to see it, here's some things I want you to start looking for. So if you've seen the movie, and so the, the girl's character, um, her name is Reagan, the child. So I'm going to name a list of symptoms, and I want you to either like raise your hand if you think you, you saw any of these symptoms if you've seen the movie. And those of you who haven't seen it, you want to be looking for these when you watch it. Grimacing. Inappropriate smiling. Breathing instability. Uh, agitated. <laughs> resisting eye opening. Uh, catatonic, which means like immobile. Um, urinary incontinence. Abnormal postures. Like crawling backwards, yeah, abnormal movements, a state of unresponsiveness, okay, seizures, vomiting blood or foaming at the mouth, hallucinations or delusions, um, alternating between being agitated and mutism, not speaking, um, repeating words of others, 
Um, temper tantrums, insomnia, paranoia, uh, hyper religiosity, hypersexual, hypersexual behavior, uh, violent biting and kicking. Okay. Uh, let's see. Breathing instability. We talked about. Um, okay. So actually, this is really interesting. In 2007, this is actually a real medical illness. It is called anti-NMDAR encephalitis, and they've now diagnosed it. And that's your symptoms that you would have. The first presenting piece to this is usually to a psychiatrist, and they're usually committed to a psychiatric institution. They have found that actually when they give them drugs to treat this, that um, they can be cured. There's a great book. It's called Brain on Fire, and it's about one of these ladies that experienced this. And she says, like, she was vomiting blood, foaming at the mouth. Oh, and the other uh, symptom of it is that afterwards there's no memory. No memory that any of this happened. And feeling like you're possessed by the devil. And a lot of this has happened, they found it in females, they found it in children and adolescents, and it's really hard to diagnose. One of the really cool things about this though, when you're thinking about mental illness, is they're linking some of it as well to schizophrenia and other types of psychosis, is that we're now going to blend the fields of neuroscience in with mental health and psychiatric um, medicine. So that we know that now there's maybe more causes. In the past, we've locked people up, or, and they used to in the 1800s, they actually would drill like holes in their skulls. So obviously something was going on in their brain. That's what they're finding with this encephalitis to try to let the demons out. So they were sort of on to something just with a cultural misperception. So move on to the next slide. Uh, stereotype three is also that those with um, mental illness are violent um, and many can function very normal everyday lives. And now we're going to get into some of the psychology of fear with the next slide. I will say I've never seen anyone do that. <laughs> Even when I worked in patient. That's, that's pretty creepy. I also want to say that Meredith chose these pictures. I, that was what I did. Um, Horse speaks to us. Evolutionary psychology. Anyone who's worked with me or heard me wax psychological, I apologize because I always talk about evolutionary psychology, but that's because I love it and I think it explains a lot of weird human behavior. Um, but, uh, but basically, just in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll cut to the chase. Um, we are hardwired, we come into this world hardwired to, uh, to look for threats. I tell a lot of my clients that you know, our brain doesn't care if we're happy, it just wants us to stay alive. And so we are wired to look for threats, we're wired to worry, we're wired to pay attention to things like that. Um, there's that image in particular is, particular, that's, that's creepy. Um, but the reason we pay attention to that, the reason I, you know, I've seen it a hundred times now and it still kind of gets me, is because, um, and this is kind of interesting, uh, the part of the human brain that uh, mediates the fear response is the amygdala. And um, they've done studies that have found that the amygdala uh, pays, it responds most strongly to images of animals. Not people, not environmental cues or, or landscapes or anything like that, but to animals. Uh, probably to keep us from, to keep us alert in the presence of animals and to keep us from getting eaten um, because we do have these caveman brains that, you know, we, we've evolved, but, but our brains, as far as our brains are concerned, we're still caveman, cavemen and we still just need to stay alive. And so it's probably no accident that so many monsters, um, so many um, horrific images that you see in horror films um, are something like this. You know, you see this child looks like, I think that's a child, looks like she wants to eat us. Um, or and of course, has. Or, or has already eaten somebody and is, and is coming after us next. Um, and that taps something very, very primal in us. Um, we are repelled by it, but we also can't look at, you know, look away. So, uh, next slide. Or did you have anything more to say about evolutionary No, stuff? really just the evolutionary psychology. So we have this fight or flight response that Stephen was talking about, but it comes out of like, you know, Disney gets their material from Grimm's fairy tales, which are really actually very grim. And they were meant to teach people to pass down to kids and other people. You shouldn't go into the forest at night. Uh, it's a dangerous place. You shouldn't like walk up to strangers. And so there's a purpose for fear. It helps keep us alive. And I think that's the whole evolutionary. And we really are not that far evolved from the whole caveman. 
like Stephen said, um, to where we are now. So it's that fight or flight response that I know he's going to talk about. So mm -hmm. with the next slide. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, 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 some time ago, uh, a psychologist, Glenn Walters, uh, tried to figure out what elements of horror films um, made us pay attention to them, made, made us interested in them. And he, and he, he named three, tension, which is sort of self-explanatory, um, relevance, um, a film has to be relevant for potential viewers, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, and unrealism. Um, unrealism is important because for us to enjoy the, you know, as part of that fight or flight response, we get a rush of adrenaline, a rush of dopamine. Um, it's not necessarily pleasant and our brain doesn't know the difference between whether we're going to uh, uh, about to get into a car accident or about to get assaulted or whether we're just watching a movie um, our brain doesn't know the difference our body doesn't know the difference so we have to have for us to enjoy it we have to have the unrealism that's that's an important element um, and the relevance just to touch on that um, very quickly uh, because the exorcist, uh, the exorcist does a great job of being relevant, especially in 1973, but still some elements today. Because um, when we talk about relevance, we talk about there's kind of three aspects of it, or three ways that something is relevant. It's universal, it's a universal fear, like that innate fear I talked about, and certainly with the exorcist, um, we have, you know, that's covered by the visceral stuff, the gross out. Um, Reagan's horrible appearance and the way she moves in certain scenes, such as the spider walk, that, that upsets our brain when we see it. Um, and so there is that sort of, it doesn't matter what culture you're a part of, um, what you're afraid of, what you're not afraid of, we react strongly to those images. Um, cultural though, uh, because we live in a largely Judeo-Christian um, country, uh, you know, certainly the exorcist religious themes um, play upon that and, and are what played a big part in, in horrifying a lot of people. Um, and finally, uh, the social um, the social aspects also made it relevant, and especially in 1973 because, you know, in The Exorcist you have the story of a mother who's watching her child's personality, you know, disappear. She's, she's losing her child to what she doesn't know. Um, and in 1973, it, that was especially relevant because, um, you know, we were kind of the tail end of the 60s, entering the 70s, and this was a generation of parents who were afraid that they were losing their kids. Um, you know, there were uh, the counterculture, revolutionary ideas going around. And so in 1973 and probably in 1971 when the book came out, that was, you know, that probably packed a wallop and contributed to um, just the worldwide interest in this movie. So. Next. I think your students came up with these. Didn't they did. They did. So these are just kind of funny little sayings. Um, one of the things. Yeah. Uh, but they actually touch on, you know, some of the things we're talking about, like how else can you imagine your grandparents killing you and your sibling? That's novelty, right? Who, who hasn't wanted to see how that might go down? Um, yeah, and one of the. Um, research components that is out there is that people like to watch scary movies together because it brings strangers together like very quickly because there's a shared with that heightened fear and you've got that adrenaline rush and there's all this like danger and this really intense experience you're closer to the people around you so that's one way in sort of our global society that we're trying to like connect with others um, I think of that. I mean, if you've ever had a crisis and you've been around strangers in a crisis, think how close you got and how quickly that happened and how you have that bond. Bible camp. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, and that speaks also to the snuggle theory again, which I hate even referring to the snuggle theory, but that's really what they call it. But um, but yeah, in, in those moments, there's there's um, there's more uh, you know you're, you're more bonded to your date. So I think we're ready to move on. Well, come on. Um, this is another one, and again, in the interest of time, I don't know if you wanted to say any, uh, say anything about any of these because I think your, some of your students, I mean, they really did their research, um, and and a lot of these touch on what we've already talked about. You know, there there is the you know when we talk about symbolic catharsis, that's that relief you feel. Um, also, um, the the theory that by watching violent images, and again, this is, you know, makes people uncomfortable to talk about, but it does sort of purge some of your own violent impulses and tendencies. One I did just want to touch on because, 
you know, but people who like horror often get that question: is why do you like that stuff? Are you are you twisted? You know, you get the get the funny looks. Um, but it's not always negative. There are positive aspects to the horror experience and to the horror story. And, and one of them um, is, you know, the uh, increase of the sublime is how uh, I think one of your students put it, which is um, an interesting way to put it. But uh, you know, one thing, it, it's an interesting that um, William Peter Blatty, who wrote this book, um, always kind of put it out there. He, he said, I didn't intend to write a horror story. I wanted to write uh, exploration of faith and spirituality, which when you kind of boil down the exorcist, that's, you know, that's, that's what we're looking at. Um, because, and I think this point is made in the book, maybe in the director's cut we're going to see, not in the version I've seen, but, uh, but at one point someone says, you know, if, if you can believe in the devil, if we can now believe in the power of the devil, we have to believe that there is a power that is good. And that is what, um, you know, a lot of, of horror films and horror literature, especially ones that, uh, that deal in the supernatural, they sort of expand the boundaries and, um, and show us sort of a, another aspect, a, a mystical aspect of life that even though we are immersed in these horrifying images, um, there's almost something refreshing. Like, you know, in The Exorcist, um, it's, it's, it's the power of good that drives the demon out at the end. And, and Blatty himself, the author, said that he always felt like it was a positive um, ending and was dismayed that so many people kind of saw, you know, see the ending as a downer. And no, no, uh, not to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it. But, um, and there's a couple of different endings, so I'm not sure which one we're going to see. We might see the more positive ending. I'm not really sure. Um, but anyway, so there's that aspect of it as well. Okay, and the next slide. So. Uh, and I know Stephen's going to talk about this, but I think that one thing, most people say if they saw this like as a child, it scarred them. Like if they snuck into where someone was watching it or they had a slumber party. Or I had one friend who said, I saw this the first time when my parents took me to the drive-in theater of this and they thought I was asleep in the back seat. They weren't being bad parents, they just thought I was asleep, but I watched it and so was terrified by it. So I think sometimes... You know, you have to think about your development when you see something and why something scares you the way it does. Um, and I know you were going to talk about. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just, um, you know, this, this conjures childhood memories. I don't know how many people were like me who actually did see a little too much of The Exorcist when they were children. Um, I don't know how much of that actually shaped my personality today. But, uh, <laughs> But this movie takes me back to childhood every time I watch it. Um, and there's a lot of horror films like that. I was simultaneously fascinated by them and repulsed by them. I wanted to see them, but I didn't want to see them. Or I wanted to see them, but from, you know, at, at an angle and maybe with my fingers in the way, so I could, you know, could only make out so much of it. Um, so there is that aspect of it. It's just kind of fun. And for a lot of people who grew up watching these or their parents grew up watching these, you know, it does kind of take you back to that time. Um, the amygdala we already talked about, there it is in the brain. Um, you can blame that for, for most of your anxiety. Um, but yeah, the, the, the catharsis that I mentioned too earlier, it allows for confrontation of fears in a safe environment. Um, again, the unrealism. We know that at the end of this, no matter what our blood pressure does, uh, no matter what cortisol and adrenaline start flowing, at the end of it, we're, unless something really awful happens, we're going to get out of here okay. Um, and so that's what makes it an enjoyable experience for people like you, anyway. Not for everybody, but for people like you. Um, and, uh, and then I think, yeah, the, this, this last uh, thing is kind of in interesting. Um, we talked about how the brain, the body, don't know the difference between um, being confronted with a real trauma, a real accident, something, a real threat, versus watching The Exorcist. And so you might have a reaction, especially if you haven't seen this, 28 times, um, and it's still relatively novel, um, you might have a, a similar reaction to if you had just, you know, narrowly escaped a car accident or something. Um, and those, and, and this is sort of a, a, I guess, a darker side of the horror film experience is that, you know, some research has shown that, well, yeah, is that that can last after exposure to this movie, uh, or to horror films in general, um, that those effects will last. But again, that's where our higher brain comes in and says, okay, it was just a movie, we can enjoy it, we can calm down, take deep cleansing breaths, all that good stuff, and just relax. And um, so, yeah, that's all I got. Yeah, um, so the last slide, I think, um, we're moving into the last slide, right? That is the last slide. Okay, well then I only had a couple more comments then. Um, so one of the things that we really, what kind of people like 
to watch this. And a lot, some of the research has shown like adolescent males or people who are thrill seekers, people who like to, some people like to ride roller coasters, some like to go to haunted houses, some like to watch horror films. And a lot of it is what I think Stephen is saying. There's also a sense of accomplishment. You get through it and you were scared, but it really is not real life. And you have gotten kind of a heightened sense of arousal, but then you're back in the real world. And that's sort of that. Um, the other thing is I think that what Stephen talked about is the fear, the, the fear of the unknown. So we're always like, What's out there that's not mortal? What is out there? Whether it's religious beliefs or the supernatural. And so right now, I mean, you see there's fascination with zombies and monsters and, you know, the demons or devils and all that. But that's been around when we talk about evolutionary since ancient times. Before we had therapists, you had ancient shamans <laughs> that would perform rituals to try to, you know, get these demons or spirits out of people. Um, I think now we'll open up to questions. Saying shut up and get on with the phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's me. How old were you when you first saw it? Me? Yes. Like seven, but that was only about five minutes. <laughs> that was all I could take. And then after the shock and trauma wore off, it was about another four years before I could force myself to sit through it. And now I love it. I really do love it, but I remember having to sort of almost like we do with, with clients who are afraid of uh, snakes or something, or afraid of crowds, is, is like I had to do like exposure therapy on myself. Why? I don't know. Um, I think I suspect that I would like it someday and, uh, and want to explore it further. But uh, yeah, I, it, it, took some, it took some time. Yeah. When you're watching horror movies, do you find yourself obviously following the character, but more analyzing why they're doing what they're doing as, as opposed to actually enjoying the film? Well, I think some of the time this gets into our, our bigger fear, and I'll let Stephen also talk to this, it's like, we go, you are so stupid to walk into that basement and it's dark and, you know, why don't you go call for help? Why are you investigating that? I mean, so we sit there and have that dialogue, and I think that's our way of, like, knowing that it's not real life. Well, if that were me. I would not do that. I wouldn't act like that stupid person that's now, you know. Um, so I think that's the dialogue that I think that some of the literature has found. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, uh, and, and, and again, I guess going back to that sort of uh, socialization aspect too is, is also we learn kind of what not to do by watching some of these films. And so, you know, there is, there is something kind of helpful about, like, you know, Meredith said, is you, you, we learn, don't go into the woods after dark from just the Grimm's fairy tales. How many of those started that way? Um, you know, so it's, uh, it, we, we can learn a lesson. Don't go into that basement. And, and if it were me and I was Damien Karras, the mental health expert slash priest called in to, to look at this case, I would have been there five minutes and I would have said, outside my realm of expertise, lady, good luck. Yeah. I think it's safe to say, with the way people looked at this film, that this movie ruined Linda Blair's career. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Well, that picture alone. <laughs> yes, and she was uh, she was apparently injured her back and got some like hypothermia filming this and developed a real fear of cold. Uh, I think just from the filming of this movie, yeah. And and then just did a whole bunch of bad movies after that. So. We can say that Friedkin did an amazing job making this that much more of a classic. I mean, it was taboo and everything that that we seek to envy, but him like jerking the actors back and slamming them against the walls yeah. and things like that, that I found out from talking to you, Stephen, is, <laughs> I mean, just makes this film that much greater. Yeah, and that's one of the things that a lot of these directors are doing with horror films. It's the lighting, it's the way they do like close-ups and then they back out and the zooming and, yeah. you know, there's lots of ways to make you feel like you're more in the experience or, you know, camera behind you or in front of you. And there's probably uh, academic film school papers yeah, uh, that, I, that you know, we could talk three hours about how just camera work alone, or, or in The Exorcist especially, pay attention to the sound, because uh, freaking really, he, he tried intentionally to make the sound so jarring that he would jump from one scene to another, um, and there would be like a cut in sound, or would introduce a, a, a 
sort of a loud, jarring sound, and uh, and so yeah, we could we could talk for hours just about that and how those sort of play on again those universal innate sort of caveman parts of us that that uh, that get startled or, or get get scared by the imagery or the lighting or what have you. Yes. I was uh, reading somewhere that like the oldest religious writings, the Vedas, a lot of it was about the fear of the dark. Do you think that some of the fear is just our bodies telling us to get more damn sleep and get rid of the insomnia? I think, you know, there is a lot of psychological research on that. So we sort of have what we call collective unconscious. Um, so we have, there are certain fears. There's good and evil. There's the dark shadow. And a lot of that is around night or it's around evil. If you see like comic book characters are portrayed, there's always like that dark figure and then the other like good figure. And so I think we talk about that evolutionaries. We have a collective unconscious that we don't, that we just share by being humans. And so maybe that, I think that fear of the dark is in part of that collective unconscious. And they're That's finding it. actually that, um, just to uh, type of what you're saying, uh, and this fascinated me, there's um, this idea of ancestral DNA almost, that, or ancestral, like the, these, these memories, and, and they found that the, um, phobias are passed down, and so someone can have a fear of snakes, never having encountered a snake, but dad was terrified of snakes, so for some reason you got that. Um, and it's really interesting, and so the, yeah, there is this idea that um, you know, we don't start over with every generation, and, and, and in some cases, it doesn't even have to be learned by a caregiver. Um, don't go, you know, don't, don't go outside after dark. Don't, you know, don't touch that snake. That it's just passed down um, through our DNA. So some of these fears are inherited from our ancestors. Right there. All right, we're watching a movie. We're dealing with sight and sound, so we have both senses going on. Sure. Which one Sensor. do you think, you know? takes over the most, because you have scenes in the Exorcist that are just loud sounds that makes jump, but you also have scenes in Psycho where, you know, you, yeah. see, the, you see the knife, but the it, psycho never actually, scene. it never yeah. actually cuts her, though. So we see things that weren't there. We all perceive sensations differently. So some people here would be more um, perceptive to sound and others to light, others to smells, others to textures, others to... So I think it really depends on how you're wired on what's going to hit you more. But yeah, that's all part of what the director's trying to do. Mm -hmm. And we were talking at dinner. Interesting you asked that question. These are great questions. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we were talking at dinner about how the brain sometimes has a tendency to um, fill in details that you, know, you, you might remember an event that you actually weren't there for, <laughs> but someone told you about it, and so your brain sort of filled in the details. And that's certainly what happened in Psycho. With that scene, you know, we we could have sworn we saw her get stabbed, but he never actually shows the knife going in. It probably couldn't have gotten away with it at that time, even if he wanted to. Um, but he didn't need to because our our brains do the rest of the work. That's a good question. And someone behind you, yeah. Yeah, I was just besides The Exorcist. What are some of your favorite horror movies? I mean, The Shining is one for me because I like watched it. Well, when I had a babysitter and I was too young, and I crept downstairs and then I saw it and it scared the, you know. So that's and it's got a lot of psychological implications. Um, you. Oh uh, yeah, The Shining is is a great one. Um, there's a there's a Spanish movie called Rec. I don't know if anyone's ever seen Rec. R E C. Like record. Um, and, and the last five minutes of that are, are damn near unbearable. I, it's it's a really good. It's a zombie film, but they do it in a different way, and even the sequel's good. But that's one that really got me. Um, uh, I, I there's a couple that they've shown here recently. Good Night Mommy was great. Um, mm, there's another yeah. one that we've seen as Babadook. And then what is yeah. that one of the country scene? The Strangers. Uh, the Strangers. So that oh, one really is scary because it's like a couple, they've left a wedding and they're like staying in somebody's like farmhouse and then knock, knock, knock. Because you were home. Yeah. And then, I mean, and of course they open the door, you know, because someone's out there like screaming, please help me. And it's a female. And it's like, it's really creepy if you've ever like stayed out in the country. Yeah. And unlike The Exorcist, which, you know, I guess we could argue the reality of, you know, demonic possession. But the strangers, I mean, you know that's had to probably happen at least once. So yeah. that makes sense. I, I, won't even, I don't watch the strangers. Dennis? The movie After Dark about the blind lady that was in, locked Wait in the room. The 
Oh, wait until dark. Wait yes. Until dark. Wait until dark. Yes. yes. And what a great, that. what a great use of of the senses. Uh, yep. You know, because I, I think the last few minutes are she's turned out every light in the house or broken every light in the house, and and the whole everything is dark, and all you hear is the breathing. And so yes. that's that dark theme you were yeah. talking about. Yes. Okay, so what about gore? Like, why are some people so disgusted by blood, and others are just same thing with sensory. I think so it's that, a visual kind of right. Kinda thing. Okay. And I think it, you know, the gore. I think the people that like the gore, and I, I, project, I really don't. I'm, I'm not uh, a gore hound, but I think the people that do like that, I think it appeals to the sense of novelty, that sense of I wonder what you would look like if you ever ripped open. <laughs> You know, there are some people that, that wonder about that. Um, but it's interesting because they've done experiments with, with kids who will happily sit through Saw um, or, or, you know, one of those you know, torture porn kind of films. And they can sit through it and laugh and, and they're fine. But if they showed them a documentary that had graphic images, they, they wouldn't continue to watch it. And so, again, I guess that unrealism, you know, and, and, I, and, and maybe all of us have different filters as far as how unreal we like our horror. But... Um, uh, but yeah, so that unrealism, I guess, allows people who do love that stuff to to kind of sit back and go, well, you know, it's it's all fake still, even though it's horrible to watch. Let's do one more. Okay, one more question, and then we'll hit the film. Yeah. Can we watch the movie now? <laughs> no, you have to leave. I'm leaving. No. <laughs> well, let's give him a big round.